to have you once more as we embark on our 51st webinar since the pandemic. It's been a journey. The shutdown took place. Choose Life International's office basically went on a standstill, shut down totally, no face-to-face -face counseling. We brought together a group of people to ask the question, what are the opportunities that COVID-19 present to Choose Life International? And out of that, the idea of doing these webinars was born. And it has been a journey. Hello, Avril. It's just good to see you again and so many others. Some of you have been to more than 25 and more than 30, probably more than 40. And we really appreciate the fact that you are able to come and to share with us on a Sunday evening. Yes, and I know it's not because you don't have anything else to do, but because you want to support us and because you find that these webinars are useful. It is such a delight to have these professionals who have partnered with us over the, the few months. Uh, we are able to offer to this to you free because they are not charging us as they serve uh, with us in this capacity. It is part of our effort to give back to the nation of Jamaica and the nations even beyond Jamaica. So thanks so much to all of you who have contributed your time, your talent, your resources to help us make this happen. Thanks to the committee that continues to plan these. Thanks to Jordan and the team who continue to provide technical support as we seek to, to be engaged in doing what we believe is useful to help this nation. One of the verses of scripture that has helped me along my journey of life is in First Chronicles that says, children of Issachar, who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. It is good for us not to understand the crisis that we are in, but to know how to respond. And that's been our passion to be relevant and to be able to serve people even in the midst of the crisis. What an opportunity it is to have stayed in Jamaica and, and have gone to Barbados on Thursday of last week to have done something with Norman Manley Law School, to have done something at Wisinko and something with my local church, all uh, over Zoom, something that we never explored before COVID-19. Yes, we are grateful for the opportunities that are there. Let us not be paralyzed. Let us not focus on the problems only but let's focus on what are the opportunities that the problems uh, present. It is good for our emotional health to be able to just think possibilities and live in hope. So these webinars on suicide prevention have been held over because of the demand following the World Suicide Prevention Day. And thanks again to our sponsors, Thanks again to our participants. Thanks to the Ministry of Education who just had so many people that came out. Thanks to our presenters for a very successful uh, World Suicide Prevention Day event. As you know, we had presenters from Pakistan, England, Trinidad, and of course from Jamaica. What a quality presentation. We're also carrying some of the World Suicide Prevention Day footing for, on our TV show, Geared to Live, which is on MTM TV Thursdays at 6.30, with rebroadcast on Saturdays at 6, 6 p.m. We ask you to join in and benefit from those shows also. Yes, we believe that we are our steps are ordered by the Lord, and we are in this because God has called us to it. And so as we uh, come into sharing in today's event, we want to pray and ask the Lord's blessing on our time um, together. And before I introduce to you our moderator, who is no stranger to these um, platforms, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to share together in this way. I pray, Lord, that you will lead 
I pray over our moderator, Cargel. I pray that you just bless her, continue to use her as you have used her before. I pray over our presenter, Dr. Earl Wright. Thank you, Lord, for his willingness to partner with us. Thank you, Lord, for the ways in which you have used him to enrich our lives and to enrich the lives of so many people. We pray for all our participants today. We ask that you will bless, that you will guide, and that everything will go well. Fulfill purpose, God, as only you can, as we say thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We would like to just also take the opportunity to let you to remind you or to let you know that on October 1, Choose Life International will celebrate 12 years of service. And we will be having a service of Thanksgiving, uh, celebrating the goodness of the Lord on, on Thursday at 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. We're joining in with Swallowfield Chapel. And uh, we ask you to plan to be with us. Before this meeting is over, we will give you the Zoom link, the information, the password and ID for that Thursday meeting. Invite your friends. And also we continue tomorrow where we will have our final session on suicide prevention this time around. And we're going to be talking about best practices in suicide prevention. My wife, Faith, and I will be the main presenters. And we have some probably two other guest uh, presenters, including Dr. Donald Stewart, who is going to be talking about um, spirituality and suicide. Um, just what are the best practices from a spiritual standpoint in dealing with suicide. We ask you to come out and join us for that too. Uh, Cargel, welcome. Dr. Um, Earl Wright, welcome. Uh, Mrs. Cargel, Earthlight, welcome. So now it is my pleasure to hand over to our moderator for the afternoon, Mrs. Cargel, Earthlight a professional uh, who is trained in marketing and sales, a woman with a passion to serve the Lord, somebody who volunteers with Choose Life International, and it's such a joy to have her as part of the team. So without any further delay, I now hand over to our moderator for the afternoon. Let's make her welcome. Yay! <laughs> Thank you so much for that warm welcome, Dr. Thomas. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. It's such a pleasure to be here. 51 webinars, how awesome is that? And guess what guys, we could not have done it without you because if you were not participating and joining with us every single week, then this would not even make sense. So thank you so much for that. Our special presenter for this evening is none other than Dr. Earl Wright. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He's a consultant psychiatrist. He's also president of the Jamaica Psychiatric Association and chairman of the Mental Health Technical Group, MOHW. He is the past director of mental health and substance abuse services in the Ministry of Health. Previously, he held a similar position as Director of Community Mental Health Services for the State of New York for the Borough of Manhattan. A Kingston College old boy and a medical graduate of the University of the West Indies, he completed his postgraduate medical education at Harlem Hospital, which is also affiliated with Columbia University in New York, where he did his psychiatry residency and also obtained a master's in public health, specializing in community health, and that was from Columbia University. After becoming chief of service and director of residency training for Manhattan Psychiatric Center at New York University, he later took the position of medical director for Upper Manhattan Mental Health Center. He returned to Jamaica in 1984, two years and for good in 1992, during which he worked as the medical officer of health in St. Thomas's health department. And this was before he took up the position of director of mental health at the Ministry of Health. There, he guided the process of integration of mental health with general health care services in the government health service and championed 
the promotion of mental health. And we have the pleasure of speaking with this gentleman this evening, Dr. Earl Wright. He will be presenting on depression and suicide. And I'm sure we want to hear everything that he has to say. Please remember that you can post your questions in the chat and once he's finished presenting, then we will get to them. So without any further ado, Dr. Earl Wright, over to you. Thank you very much, Kajal. Can I share my screen? Yes, okay. Okay, gonna be talking to you this afternoon on major depression and uh, as a precursor to suicide. Um, one of the things we know that is always, always starts with stress because stress is what happens in our, our everyday life as we deal with the everyday changes in life as a whole. The only time, the only time you don't have stress is when you are dead. As long as you are alive, you will have to deal with stress. And that's especially significant in this COVID time. Everybody dealing with stress at some level because COVID is an unknown entity. And it's not one of those stressors that you have for a couple of days and it goes away. It's been with us for many, many months and we have no idea when it will end. So what needs to happen is that we have to manage our stress because if the stress level is too high, then what's going to happen is going to affect your physical and mental health, going to cause mental health problems, physical health problems, going to cause major depression, going to cause anxiety. And we know that in some countries, there have been an increase in the incidence of suicide. So it all starts with stress. And if you know, stress enters the body through everything that's happening around us. And when it enters the brain, the brain tries to manage the stress, fight it or flight, fight or flight mechanism, or some of us freeze. So it's fight, flight, or freeze. And the body deals with it through secreting chemicals throughout the body that affects the various organs that we go by. So, but it starts much earlier than that. Because they have a saying in Jamaica, what gone bad a morning, difficult to come good a evening. And really, the brain activity, how we are formed with the brain, peaks at age three years. Yes, many of what the things we do now are set in motion at age three, before age three, and there are prime times for development. We know that warm, responsive, caring, for children supports brain development, particularly the ways, the pathways, determining emotion and how we control our emotions later on in life. And stressful or traumatic events undermines the development and lowers the threshold for activation of how we manage stress later on in life. And it's been well documented in Jamaica that we know that Professor Hicklin, who passed recently, he did his studies and found that 40 odd percent of individuals in Jamaica right here had what we call personality disorders. And these personality disorders have difficulty managing, controlling their impulses and managing their stress. Now, if you look at this, what this shows is how the brain is. This is how the brain is when they are born. And then by age six, see how thick it is? Lots of connection. But by age 14, if you don't use the pathways in the brain that is used, say, 
the ones that are not used die and wither. So we're talking about that there are critical periods where you, the brain is able and learns to manage your emotion. Well known that if you have what we call cross eye and you don't fix it early, if you don't fix cross eye by age six, age five actually, and you fix it later on, then you're not going to have proper vision regardless. If you don't fix it within this time frame, early in life, then the brain not gonna handle it correctly. And the same thing with emotional control. By age five, the child has learned to manage their emotions effectively, or it becomes very difficult later on to manage their emotions. And also biases. Certain parts of our brain are geared towards basis reflex action and that happens very early in life learning peer skills and other languages and symbols continues for a longer period of time so if you'll follow this graph this is not a way of showing it preschool years and school years vision by age four and then it wanes hearing by age three, four, and then it wanes again. Emotion, habitual way of responding, emotional control. And then you have the others that will come. Language, although you might, if you don't learn a new language quickly, early in life, you always have an accent and conceptual thinking and not peer social. Socialization continues for a long time and learning numbers. So what we're talking about is that if somebody is abused, if the child isn't taken care of early in life, then you have a brain that looks like this. The dark parts show non-functional brain. This is a healthy brain with all the reds and yellows. The parts here are the parts that manage your basic functions, your heart, etc that continues to function. So what's basically happening is that the early years sets you up for the mental disorders later. And it's been known for many, many years that when a child loses an adult early in life, when you are separated from your mother, and I say your mother because mother is the major caregiver, support from the father when you are separated from your mother effective caregiving early in life then you are more susceptible to develop depression or later on in life and this has been documented from for many 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 years but it's not only being there because what's also important if you put the child in front of the television then that child brain is also not going to be developed properly. You have to have face-to-face -face communication. You have to have pro conversation with eye, eye orientation, vocalization, gestures, movement of the arms and coordination for the child to be able to express and be aware of emotion. So putting the child in front of a television, the child might see the television, but it's not going to help the child later on. And the Pediatric Association recommends very limited or no um, screen time before age two. <laughs> Don't put the child in front of the television or give the child screen time. It should be minimum before age two. So what we're really talking about is each nerve cell, the brain, forms itself to adapt to the environment. And each cell develops to whatever is happening combination of genetics and environment and what you use stays and what you don't use you lose 
So what we're talking about is chemical imbalances that cause uh, depression and other disorders later in life, anxiety. And it's been well documented that a specific chemical of the brain called serotonin is linked to suicide. They have done a lot of postmortems on people who have committed suicide. And it has been shown that in those postmortems, that the brain, the serotonin level in those individuals have been low. So what are the emotional signs when you are having too much stress? Tearfulness, irritability, flying off the handle, mood swings, overreacting, extra sensitive to criticism, being defensive, feeling out of control, lack of motivation, and you get angry very easily. Frustration always comes easily, and there's a lack of confidence, and you don't feel good about yourself. Also, there is an inability to concentrate. And what we know about people that are under severe stress is that they have problems in making decisions. And then there is a memory lapsing. They can't say something specifically. They give vague, very strong. You are easily distracted. You move from one topic to another. The creative side of you diminishes substantially. And you start worrying. In Jamaica, they, you, you, they say that you become, you start worry about, con, you, con, you become confused and worry about many, many things. And you have negative thinking. If you win the lottery, you start worry about the people coming to rob you. And if you get a nice new Spanking Lexus or Mercedes Benz, you start think about the crash that you're going to end up in. So you always look at the negative side of life. You can't enjoy things. Things that you used to enjoy, you're not enjoying anymore. You can't relax. And you become prone to accidents, making more mistakes, and you start forgetting things. And you have changes in health practices, and you start increase your smoking, especially the men start smoke more, although the women start smoking these days too, drinking more alcohol, start eating a lot of comfort food, you know, the ice cream and the cake, etc. So you start putting on weight, although some people might start go the other way and not. Um, eat as much, and then the exercise goes through the through the window because you tell yourself you don't have enough energy to exercise. You can't sleep properly. You go to bed. It's seven o'clock. One o'clock you're still awake. Three, three o'clock you're still awake, or you go to bed at seven o'clock and you wake up at seven the next morning and you draw the cup over your head and say, boy, I can't, not going to work this morning. And then you're, even those that go to work have what we call presenteeism. And they are unable to manage their time. And even though they are at work, poor work, and there's increased abs absenteeism. And then they, the change, the personal appearance changes. The lipstick not there anymore, the nail polish all crack and chipped up if you used to wear, and you don't, your nails not so clean, your clothes not nice like it used to, etc. So there is a self neglect and change in appearance, and also accepted yawning and tired. Talking too fast or too loud, fiddling, twitching. And if you notice, you see some people when you look on the nails, it's bite down to the right down to the quint. They, they bite in grinding feet. They're always drumming on the counter, pacing. And then there's social withdrawal. You don't go out anymore. You don't go to church. When people come to visit you, you tell the 
whoever is around, tell them I'm not at home. I don't want to see a soul. Not going out, not going to the parties anymore, not going to the social function. And then there's the relationship problem because of the irritability, etc. Sleeping problems, the same. You become reckless, start taking more risks, driving faster, it's risky behavior. The aggressiveness and the anger house birth, angry outbursts, nervousness, and there's also lying to cover the traps. So what we're talking about is stress. Uncontrolled stress interferes with clear judgment and decision making, affects fine motor coordination. You things that you used to do well, you can't do, reduces our ability to deal with large amount of information and damages our frame of mind that you need to do work. Important to recognize when you are under too much stress. Don't rationalize it away. And one of the first steps, if you're not managing well, especially if you're not sleeping, not eating, is to go see your doctor or someone that you can talk about because behavioral symptoms are the one that are first noticed and they are more obvious. And, but, and over time, they have not been going away. Sometimes they've been there for many months or many years. So let me just touch on man managing stress, not going to go in much detail today. And I always start, especially in time of COVID, Grant me the courage to change the things I can change, the serenity to accept the things I can change, and the wisdom to know the difference. So it's important to change what can be changed. Change your perception about what you cannot change. There is always, always something you can learn from a negative experience. With the COVID, you heard Reverend Dr. Thomas talk about in the COVID period, he had found new ways to cope, opening of new opportunities. So you can change your perception about what's happening and look for the positive and accept what cannot be changed. Keep your perspective and look for the positive, but you have to look for it. If you don't look for it, you can find it. Also ask for help. Many stressful situations cannot be resolved without the help of a network of people, including people we know professionally, socially, our family, and people in the public service. Within your organization, your professional networks, including your boss, your colleagues present, past, your past team, and form organizational support. You can also get help from clients, suppliers, professional organization, trade unions, etc. Social network, there are lots of social clubs, social organization, and churches that you can get help from. Offer support group, talk to other people about a problem, and many times they will find options that might be worth trying that you might not have thought of. Family, always reach out to them, also extended family. And it says here, Matthew 7, 7, ask and you will receive, search and you will find, knock and the door will be open. In other words, if you, you need to ask and search for the solution. Because what we've been talking about is stress when you are overstressed. And one of the things we know about depression is that individuals who have had trauma early in their life, who have had significant losses in their life, who have had the genes for depression, are more susceptible to 
develop major depressive disorder. And what happens? You have major stressors and you feel sad. You lose a job, you lose a relationship, somebody in your family die and you feel depressed and you get over it. And then another stressor comes and you manage it again. And then there is a stressor that comes and then the depression sets in and stays. And depression is a sustained feeling of sadness over two weeks. This is what we're talking about. During over the past months, have you been bothered by feeling down, depressed, or hopeless? And you ask these two questions. During the past month, have you been bothered by having little interest or pleasure in doing things? And if the answer to either of those, either of those is yes, then you start asking about changes in your weight. Have there been weight change, substantial gaining or losing weight over the past month? Changing your sleeping habit. You used to go to bed at 10 o'clock. Now you're going to bed at 3 o'clock in the morning. Or you used to go to bed at 10 o'clock. Now you go to bed at seven o'clock, sleep until the next morning and still feel tired. Not being able to stay still, can't stay still. You feel agitated or you, people tell you, you look slow down. And this is the most common complaint of individuals coming to doctors in Jamaica. Fatigue, loss of energy and feeling tired. And the doctor do a full examination and they can't find any physical reason why the individual is feeling this loss of energy and feeling tired. And feeling of worthlessness, feeling that you, have, you blame yourself for all the things that happened from way back, from your adolescent, straight back until now, all the things that had happened to you and other people, you begin to feel guilty about and blaming yourself. Poor concentration, unable to concentrate, diminishability to think or concentrate nearly every day. And then we move to recurrent thoughts of death or suicide. And if you have five of these nine, then that's the criteria that doctors make for making a diagnosis of major depressive disorder which is a medical illness. In other words, what has happened to the brain is that you have dealt with lots of stresses throughout your life and the brain is worn out now and it needs a bit of help in dealing with this particular stressor or any further stressor. Just like diabetes, you've been eating fatty food, the ice cream, the cake all your life and you might be overweight, and the pancreas, which secretes insulin, have been dealing with your blood sugar, and there comes a time in your 40s, 50s, when the pancreas can't manage the sugar anymore, and it, you develop diabetes. And I will say later on that just as how you treat diabetes, you treat diabetes by decreasing the intake of insulin, it's sugar, the, lots of carbohydrates, the cakes, the ice cream, etc. Same way you decrease the intake of stress for depression and you treat the diabetes with insulin, you treat the depression with an antidepressant. And I always show in this one, lots of men and these days, women also self-medicate themselves and they develop alcohol problem. And therefore, the, you screening what the doctor will ask is how many times during you have had X amount of drinks in, in over the past month where X for men is four drinks and X for women is five drinks. If the answer is yes, then you might be having a substance abuse problem. 
So depression is a major medical problem. It's very common, often unrecognized, often undiagnosed. And part of the lack of diagnosis is stigma. People don't want to recognize that they have a brain problem, a mental health problem. Therefore, it's often untreated or inadequately treated. And it's just like diabetes, hypertension. Diabetes is a function, a problem with the pancreas, hypertension, a problem with the blood vessels, depression is a problem with the brain and it's a serious medical problem and it interferes more with social and physical problems than many other chronic illness. The lifetime in Jamaica, the lifetime risk for depression is 10 to 25 percent for women and 10 to 12 percent for men. Women have depression twice as often as men. And it's not because of the men give them problems. It's not that at all. The reason for that is that women have hormonal upsets on a monthly basis, and therefore they are more susceptible to depression during childbirth, the parent natal period and therefore there's a specific type of depression post menopause menopausal depression and also after childbirth postnatal depression 18 percent of the general population in jamaica it ranges from 10 18 percent in the general population will have major depressive disorder. So it's nearly a quarter of the population. One in five. One in five. If you're in a room with 20 people, you're going to have at, at, at least two to three people with clinical depression. And if it's all women, you're going to have more depression. 60%, and this study was done by Dr. Maureen Anz Morgan in Jamaica, where she looked at all the suicide over a year, and she found that 60% of individuals who committed suicide in Jamaica suffered from major depression. And she found that most of the major depressive disorder was not recognized, and many people thought that they couldn't get better. They didn't see it as a medical condition and therefore they didn't get treated and therefore they ended up committing suicide. And therefore it's very important that major depressive disorder, the medical condition is recognized and treated. And if it's recognized, the earlier it's recognized, the better the treatment outcome. And we also have a high incidence of people in Jamaica with post-traumatic stress disorder because of all the violence, motor vehicle, and that's a debilitating condition that occur after exposure to a violent or terrifying event or ordeal in which grave physical occurred or was harmed, was threatened. So major depressive is a significant neurobiological that alters the several areas of the brain. And the network in the brain is changed. And we have been trying to understand how the mechanism, how it, it affects the brain, but we know that is deleterious to the brain and changes how the brain functions. And that's the, the lifetime prevalence over a lifetime. You have 18 to 20% in Jamaica. Various studies have shown. And they have done various studies. And it showed that each time, each time you have a major depressive disorder. This was a sequence treatment study that was done 
not here in Jamaica, but it found that each time you have a depressive disorder, the next time it's worse. It's a chronic disease. It builds on it. And there's also, in this study, it was also found that there is a high genetic predisposition in the families of depressive dis disorder. And these individuals with a family history, the depression occurred earlier in those individuals with a family history. And it shows that also that when you have a number of depressive episodes, further episodes are predicted not by life stressors. Sometimes after when somebody has seen somebody in their 40s and 50s and you get a history of that individual having depression earlier on, you are, many times you are, they are not able to identify a specific stressor. Many times, no, there isn't a specific reason why the individual might become depressed. And the reason for that is that their brain, because it's been injured, because that's what depression does, that's what stress does. If you have high levels of stress over time, it's going to injure specific areas of the brain, the hypothalamus and the MRI, the PET scan, is going to show that that area of the brain is smaller than in other individuals. So the lowering of the stress hole shows that you, you, you are less able to manage stress and therefore more at risk for anxiety and depression. So we're talking, and also, as we said earlier, early adverse experiences. If a child been physically abused, sexually abused, then they are more susceptible to depression. They are more vulnerable to depression later on in life. And we said this, as you saw earlier, showed you earlier, that's because at this time, the brain is much more susceptible to any injury, the first six years of life. So it's going to be very important. So the doctors will look for depression. Sometimes it's caused by thyroidism, cancer, the head of the pancreas, stroke, Parkinson's, etc. Normal bereavement may also present, you all say, if somebody has been lost somebody recently, then you do, not, you do not think of depression. You allow the person to go through the grieving process because the symptoms are basically the same. But all is not lost. Most people, 70% and over, will respond to treatment for depression. And the treatment is threefold. Talk therapy, and there's a specific type of thought, talk therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, medication, and I can't emphasize enough, daily exercise, 30 minutes of exercise, ward off depression, and manage stress. And these are the common drug treatment, SSRIs, serotonin. That Remember we said that in people who have committed suicide, it's found that the serotonin level, this chemical here is low. So there are specific drugs that to a medication that will lift the serotonin level and the norepinephrine, noradrenaline level. And it's absolutely important that you aim to get rid of all the depressive symptoms. Because if you leave some of the depressive symptoms in place and you don't get rid of them, we call partial remission, then you are more susceptible to develop the chronic illness and you have uh, depression because the illness not completely treated, then you are more likely to have 
remissions late and exacerbations later on in life. And not going into suicide today because that's a multifactorial problem, all of these things. And I know Dr. Thomas have been through that time and time again. So remember, 60% of individuals who commit suicide in Jamaica suffer from major depressive order. Therefore, the restoration of brain chemicals to obtain full remission of major depressive disorder. And remember this, it's for at least six months to a year that the medication needs to be taken important because many times individual once they feel better they stop taking the medication for the brain to return to normal and to effective treat major depression and prevent suicide all right thank you and god bless you and i'll be glad to answer any questions that have come up during the presentation thank you back to you Agile. All right, Dr. Wright, thank you so much for that thorough presentation. I think we all have a better understanding of depression and the different facets of depression. We have a lot of questions, which is great. We love it when our presenters present and then there is just, you know, that interaction from our participants. So Dr. Wright, I have a question for you though. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily speaking about major depression, but what is the difference between being sad and being depressed? Because, so, so how I understand it, everybody gets sad. You know what I mean? Things happen, things will throw us off, and we will get sad, but what, what is, isn't it natural? Yes, and that's why we start off with the stress. When you lose somebody or when something, you know, you get into a car accident or etc. You feel sad, but that's that's the, it's not sustained. You clinical depression is when you are feeling sad for two weeks or more, a month, and you are not enjoying things that you used to enjoy. And remember, it's not it's for every day or most of the day is not if you hear if you're sad lose a boyfriend lose a partner and you hear you win the lotto or you get a million dollars you'll smile for a little while right but with depression you start worrying about all the bad things that can happen and the eating you the change in eating habits for two weeks or more is sustained the sleeping pattern is changed for two weeks or more. The concentration is changed for two weeks or more. The suicidal thoughts are there for two weeks or more. So the, the symptoms, and you have to have five of the nine symptoms that we spoke about. And you you, you it has to be most of the time, most of the days, for two weeks or more. Very important. It's not that you feel sad today and tomorrow you get better. You have to have this symptom during the past month. Have you been bothered by feeling down, depressed, or hopeless? During the past month, have you been depressed? And it's for two weeks or more, most of the day, every day. And then you go to weight change, sleep disturbance, agitation or retardation, lack of energy, guilt, poor concentration, suicidal ideation. If you have three of these, you don't have major depression. You have to have at least five sustained over a period of time. Did that answer you? It's, yes, it did, it did. It's, it's an illness after the stress and the sadness, it damages the brain. And that's why I always start with stress because stress damages the brain and leads to the medical illness. Just like if you eat too much fat, you eat too much carbohydrate, it damages the pancreas and over time you have a high 
possibility of developing diabetes. So is it that major depression is something that we cause on ourselves at times? I'm not talking about the genetic aspect of it. But well, as you're using the example with diabetes, and we know that with diabetes, you have to stick, um, stick to a strict diet. Right. The same with depression. Can you feed that monster? Right. And that's why I always start with managing stress. Okay, let me start. I start even earlier. Because remember, we spoke about in the early years, right? In the early days. We started with how the brain is developed, right? Remember this? Remember this. So if you get, if you are, if you are traumatized, if you are traumatized during early period, right? Between here and here, if you are sexually abused, if you are physically abused, if you have lost a significant caretaker, then the stress, the, the chemical we call cortisol damages the brain. And therefore you become more susceptible to depression later on. If later on in life, you are always under stress, then you are going also to damage your brain and you are more liable to be develop major depression or one of the mental disorders. You are more also, you are twice as likely to have a, a heart attack or a stroke or high blood pressure if you're not managing your stress. And if you have major depression, even at rest, your cortisol level that causes the damage to the blood vessels and the heart and the liver, even at rest, the cortisol level is higher so you are more likely to have a range of physical symptoms. So I always start with the managing the stress. Because if you don't manage the stress, then you develop the mental health and the physical problems. All right. Does that, did that answer your question? You don't bring it on to yourself. <laughs> Just like how oh, you have diabetes and if you eat too much sugar, you're more likely to develop diabetes. Same principle. If you have too much stress, you labor to damage your brain and develop the mental health problems. All right. So based on what you just said, um, what happens if you have a high stress job? So for example, if you're a doctor during these COVID times or you're in the army or the defense or you're a police, you know, you're on a high stress levels for an extended period of time. And we know that, especially now when we have soldiers and officers working around the clock, having to do extended shifts, then their stress levels are elevated. So what kind of advice can we give to professionals like those who are just um, in, in a stressful period for a longer period of time than the norm? You have to manage the stress. And that's why we said that one of the most important things is managing the stress. And we talk about change what can be changed. Change our perception. You can't change COVID. So you have to accept that COVID is going to be around. And you do your things to protect yourself from COVID. And if you are at home, you decide that you are, this is a perfect opportunity to look for the positive and start doing things that you didn't do before. You look for help from other people. And one of the most important things that I always tell individuals, whatever problem you have, you need to talk to somebody about. Regardless, you don't have to talk to the person to solve the problem. You talk to the person to get it off your chest. Because when you get something off your chest, then you don't keep the emotion. The more you talk about it, the more it release the emotions attached to your brain. And the research shows very clearly 
that those individuals that always talking, they live longer than the people who keep things on the check. So my advice is to talk about everything. And the next thing you have to do is exercise. Very important, if you're not exercising every day, start exercising every day. And you don't have to go do any strenuous exercise. Go for a long walk, a long walk on a daily basis. Enjoy the sunshine, enjoy the flowers around you. Breathe in the fresh air. Live in the present while you're walking and that will relieve some of the stress. And if you, if you are at work in a stressful situation, deep breathing exercises, always helpful. The abdominal breathing, and if you go on YouTube and you look up on deep breathing, it, there are lots of things that abdominal breathing, 10 in, hold it, 10 out, 10 in, hold it for 10, and 10 out. And you breathe, do that 10 times, and you automatically feel better. Deep breathing exercises are always helpful. Meditation, sit quietly. A lot of people you know, expect to have time to sit quietly and reflect and have any time for themselves. They're always looking about other people. It's very important that you factor yourself, not saying you must be selfish, but you factor yourself and take care of yourself because what is well known, if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of other people. So you have to give yourself time to give your brain time to rest, exercise, and exercise in the morning is more effective than exercise in the evening. Have a sense of humor, dress up. When you look good, you feel good. Don't have positive people around you because we reflect our environment. So if you always have negative people around you, you yourself are going to start feeling negative. If you help others, also help to relieve stress. Because when you help other people, you we are hard wired to help other people. So when we help other people, we are helping ourselves. So all of these things, and I didn't do stress relief today because I know that um, you, you, you have stress relief for uh, lots of time, but depression and always start with stressors. So it's important, especially in COVID time, to manage your stress. And as I keep saying, there is no stressor that you can learn something from, but you have to look for it. Okay, doctor. All right, let me get to some more questions from the chat. Someone is asking, can serotonin be increased by changing one's diet? If so, what foods should be eaten? Well, we're talking about the healthy foods. If you, you shouldn't, if you have lots of fatty food, high calorie food, you, it, it decreases your energy level and decreases can move you toward not feeling as good as you should. No, they're not any specific diet that will treat your depression, but healthy eating. The usual health eating habits, lots of vegetables, protein, decrease your carbohydrate, decrease your sweet tooth. Don't eat all the comfort food because that increases you feel badly. And I always add alcohol is a depressant. Drinking alcohol, you might relieve your anxiety for a short period of time but you are going to feel depressed. You go up, but you go lower than you did before. So alcohol is not a part of your diet. Okay, so less wine. <laughs> less wine. 
the, the recommendation is one glass <laughs> of wine, but it's not the alcohol in the wine that you're talking about, you know, the flavor now. Not the, it's, it's not the alcohol that they recommend. It's what comes from the grapes. All right, Doc, thank you for that. And someone is suggesting that it is very difficult to ask for help when one is very stressed, much less when one is feeling hopeless or depressed or suicidal. How would you address that? Well, and that's where family members come in. And that's why one should be one of the risk factors for suicide and depression is living alone, not not having family members around, not having anybody to talk to, not having a support system. And therefore, when you are, there's a change in one's behavior, the family members should pick it up. Remember we said that the behavioral symptoms are some of the first symptoms that you notice. So if you see a change in a family member, if you see a change in a friend, you should try to ask them what happened, be supportive, and if it continues, get them to, with, to a doctor to do something about it. Family support, relationship support is going to be important when an individual is depressed because yes, their energy level is decreased, their social ability is decreased, therefore the external health is going to be important. So if, if it is the person who is experiencing the signs of depression, then we would just also encourage them to reach out to someone, um, someone that they trust that they can talk to, you know, just in case, yeah. yeah. Just in case they're not the, that that person is the one going through it and having a hard time reaching out to someone, but and in, out. And in Jamaica, there is the crisis helpline from the Ministry of Health that you can anonymously pick up the telephone and call. And they are online 24 seven and are available to get help to you or get you help. So there are lines, if you can't talk, you don't trust anybody to talk to, there is an anonymous helpline that is Available and Choose Life also has. I was just going to say, okay, yes, so don't important. forget Choose Life. Choose Life is there to help you to choose life. All right, Doc. The next, the next question is: Can stress and depression lead to dementia? That the the causes. Well, there are many types of dementia, right? And if you're if stress does cause what we call atherosclerosis and hypertension, right? If your blood vessels are clogged up in the brain, remember we said early on that stress can lead to stroke, right? Stress leads to stroke. So that if you have what we call mini strokes, then you are possibly you can have depression later on in life. I don't have that slide with me. But there, it, yes, it can cause a specific type of dementia, not Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is a different disorder, but it does increase your risk of developing dementia because of mini stroke or a severe stroke to specific the frontal lobe of your brain. Okay. So, Doc, can depression also lead to post-traumatic stress disorder? And if so, okay. can it be cured? Post-traumatic stress disorder, it's the other way now. Post-traumatic stress disorder have symptoms of depression. In other words, you have a severe trauma, that you get post-traumatic stress disorder and you have the symptoms of clinical major depression within. So you treat the depression within the post-traumatic stress disorder. 
and the treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder is specific psychotherapy and treating the symptoms as they come along. Okay, Doc. I know you answered this question before, but I'm going to ask again. What help can I give to someone who is depressed? What can I say or do to cheer them up? So yes, we can encourage them to reach out to someone that they trust, but what can I personally do to cheer someone up who is depressed? Well, I always say that the treatment for when you are in clinical depression, major depression, the, you need to see a doctor, especially if it's severe, moderate to severe, because the treatment for depression is threefold. One, you reduce the stressor through talk therapy. And the specific type of talk therapy that has been found by research to be more it's most effective is what we call cognitive behavioral therapy, where you change the biases and the automatic reaction, the automatic thinking of that person. So, and the second way is medication. So if the individual, if there's a specific stressor that's causing mild depression, if you deal with the stress, if you help the person, if you identify the stress in the person's life and help them to deal with it, then you might be helping them. But if it's moderate to severe, then you need to take them to a doctor and get specific help. And any doctor, one of the things I always say that Every doctor in Jamaica has been trained to treat major, to recognize and treat major depressive disorder. And the Ministry of Health has a screening tool, which they are, if you go to the diabetic clinic, if you go to the hypertensive clinic, the chronic disease, non-communicable disease clinic, then they are going to screen for major depressive disorder to see whether you have depression or not and treat it effectively. But if there is a specific stressor that the person have identified and you can help them with that stressor, remove that stressor, then you might be helping the individual. Okay. All right, another question here. Somebody, I'm guessing you can only hazard a guess at this, but can daily swelling in the face, especially- daily swelling in the face, mm -hmm. especially the upper lip, be due to depression or any other mental or brain issues? Well, one of the things you know about depression is that we always, and I underline always, have to rule out all the physical problem. And remember, we talk about thyroid problem. We talk about pituitary problem, all, all the medical problems. And that's why the first step is, we said it's a medical condition. The first step is going to your doctor and they do a physical to find out if there is anything else. Because there's a lot of physical medical problems and medication that can precipitate depression. So we always start with the physical examination, rule out all the possible causes before we say that you have clinical depression. Okay. So the first step for that individual, and if you're having swelling of the face, then, then you need to get to your doctor quickly so that they can identify what is causing it and treat it effectively. True. Can anxiety lead to depression? Two and different illnesses. I like that question. <laughs> Go ahead, you're about, sorry about. No, it's a two-part, so I'll let you answer that part first. Two different diagnoses, just like heart, you have a heart condition and a stomach problem. Two different conditions. Or better still, you have a 
hypertension and a heart problem, both cardiovascular problem, but it's two different areas completely of it. No, anxiety is a different set of symptoms than major depression, and they are treated differently. Anxiety treated with a specific medication, anxiolytic, although in the long term, the antidepressants can also be helpful for anxiety. But for anxiety, there is usually a specific stressor that needs to be removed or dealt with to alleviate the anxiety problem. So it's two different, two different okay. diagnostic categories. You mentioned that the antidepressant can be um, used to assist with anxiety, right? Right. So can the usage of that antidepressant lead to depression? No, if you are, no, the antidepressant can cause. Cannot. Cause that's, that's why it's anti. <laughs> it's antidepressant. And what it does is relieve, changes the chemicals in the brain so that Remember, depression is caused by problems with three chemicals in the brain, serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, right? So that, that's what the antidepressant does. It decreases, it increases the serotonin level and the norepinephrine or the dopamine levels. And that's why I said that the, the, the post-mortem of individuals who commit suicide has been found to have low serotonin level. Therefore, and we know that in Jamaica, 60% of individuals who commit suicide have a diagnosis of major depression. So if you treat the depression, you also decrease the incidence of suicide you decrease the incidence to some degree. Dr. Wright, I'm so happy that you mentioned that point because it reminded me of a question that I had for you. You made mention of the fact that um, depression is more prevalent in women than men. Right. You, you, you said it's not because the men, the men are the ones yeah. that are stressing out the women. All right. But <laughs> um, you mentioned that it's because women have, um, you know, their monthly menses and they go through childbirth and so they have a lot of additional emotional stresses but doc what about the fact that women are sometimes dealing with just so much so women are the breadwinners in some of their families they are in charge of the house they are dealing with the kids you know it's online school time they're dealing with that too i mean Aren't there other reasons why women would be more depressed than men? Well, I started off by telling you that it all comes back to stress. <laughs> so if the stress level in women are higher than in men, then you are going to have more incidence of depression. Although the time before the childbirth period, before in the early life, below age 13 to over 50, during the childbearing years. After the childbearing years and before the childbearing years, the incidence of depression is basically the same, right? It's during the childbearing years. So we, and you have a flare up when the hormones are out of sync. There are a set of women that on a monthly basis have major depressive problem called premenstrual depression, PMS. Premenstrual dysphoria. That's part that it's a specific illness now because it's recognized that the hormonal changes causes them to have the symptoms of depression. So yes, if women have more stress, anybody having more stress will lead to an increase of depression. So if the women are having more stress, but the hormone fluctuation 
childbirth, before childbirth, menopause, there is an increased incidence at those times. Sorry, but that's how it is. Poor so, woman, poor woman. All right, that someone else is asking if antidepressants can become addictive. No, and that's why we have great problems with treating depression with, and with the anti-anxiety medication. Because you treat depression with anti-anxiety medication, yes, you feel better initially, but you become addicted to the anxiolytic. The antidepressants are not addictive. And therefore, that's why we, after you've been on, if you are unable to remove the stressor causing the anxiety problems, then after a long period of time, we have to switch to the antidepressant because that's not addictive. While the Valium, the Xanax, the anxiolytic don't treat the depression. They help you to feel better for a while, but you're going to get addicted to them. And if there is a level of tolerance over time, so they stop working. Therefore, the antidepressants. OK. All right, let me try and wrap up quickly, because I see we have a few more questions. Um, someone is asking if certain traumas in life can cause schizophrenia, or is this another form of a mental disorder? It's another form of of a mental disorder, and you don't move from one to another. It's completely different, and the symptoms are different. If with schizophrenia, you're gonna hear voices, you're gonna have delusions of people trying to harm you, you have what we call your thought processes all over the place. You don't have that in depression. You have the symptoms that we spoke about previously, the problems with so not enjoying life, the problems feeling sad, irritable, angry, changing sleeping patterns, changing eating patterns, etc. In schizophrenia, those are not the symptoms. So it's a different, different diagnosis. There are over 300 mental disorders, each different and the treatment is somewhat different for all of them. Okay. All right. And if, you treat, if you make the wrong diagnosis, then the wrong treatment is going to happen and you're not going to get better. To get better. Okay. If you are a child at three and you are touched inappropriately, even though you did not recognize it, is it still classified as abuse? And would that child still be sus susceptible to depression? Yes. In any form of abuse, one of the things, there is a portion of the brain called the amygdala that you remember everything. You might not remember it consciously because it's a small part of your brain that you are able to bring. But if you go in what we call deep hypnosis, you can bring forward some of these memories because the traumatic memories are encoded in a part of the brain called the amygdala. And because you've been abused, then your, how you manage emotion are going to be changed. You might not recognize the reason why you are flying off the handle or not able to control your emotions as well. But that underlying trauma, that scar, emotional scar remains there. Very important. And especially in the early years, there are parts of your brain that during the first year of life, for the rest of your life, you are either going to see the world as a nurturing, loving place or a hostile environment. If you are abused early in life, you might not remember it, but you are going to see the world as a non-nurturing place. So it, you might not, but it's going to happen. And you become more susceptible to depression later on in life. Okay. Doc, how long is 
how long can someone grieve the loss of a loved one? What is the... It's very bearable. It's yeah. very, very, very bearable. And each person needs their own time to go through the grieving process. After six months and the person is still severe grieving, then they might need a bit of help to move through the process. But each, you have to treat each individual separately and give them time and help them to move through the grieving process. And one of the ways I always say, talking about it, talking about the grieving is very, very important to get it off your chest. Writing to the individual who you have lost, write them a letter. You don't have to post it. Just write the letter, what you would like to say to them, etc. But getting it off your chest and trying to move along. But each person should be treated individually and allowed to go through the various stages of grieving, the denial, the anger, the bargaining and the depression and the resolution down the line. But each individual needs to go through the stages and try to help them if they get stuck at any phase of the grieving process. And Doc, writing that letter would be good also if the person somehow blames themselves for whatever tragedy occurred. Yes, but if you blame yourself, you have to move through it too. And a lot of times the blaming themselves doesn't have anything to do with reality, right? But even if you are blaming yourself and there's reality, they, you need to move through the grieving process because the grieving process is always the same. The denial, the anger, the bargaining the depression and coming to some sort of resolution down the line. And you, so it's very important, you know, to forgive yourself for any transgression. We all have sinned, so we need to forgive ourselves as others forgive us. Someone is asking, if stress is so damaging, why aren't there stress management techniques taught to parents or caregivers and appropriate techniques, techniques taught at each stage of development? Well, there is a, there is a lot of, well, let me go at it another way. One of the things in Jamaica and many other countries, there is a high stigma. When you say mental, what people think of? Schizophrenia and madness. And just like how you have a physical health to take care of, you have a mental health to take care of. And therefore, if you are going to talk about violence in Jamaica, you have to talk about teaching mental health at the early years and the one of the things, the recommendation that the task force gave to the ministry was teaching mothers to love their children, to take care of their children in a loving, healthy way. And part of that is teaching emotional intelligence and teaching stress management techniques. And the earlier you can teach those skills, to children, the better the outcome. So if you want to take care of the violence that we have in the society, you can put as much police as you want on the streets. But if you don't take care of it in the early years, you just send in the ambulance to the scene of the, the accident and not taking care of the road surface, et cetera, et cetera. So if you want to grow a healthy society, and the research has been done here in Jamaica by one of the professors at the University of the West Indies. And it has been shown very clearly that if you teach community health age to teach their parents how to teach, take care of their children early in life, appropriate parenting, then those children are more perfect, 
They are more productive later on. They have less violence and a better human beings in the society. But you can do it after age 15 later on. Because what you reap, how a child is behaving in an adolescent year is what you sow in the early years of life. I see. All right, doctor. Um, sometimes the side effect of medication is suicidal thoughts. Is this true? Yes. And if it is true, then what is the use of the medication? <laughs> one of the things, you know, is that when you, one of the things about suicide is that when you are depressed and you have suicidal thoughts, a lot of people don't have the energy to plan. It takes a lot of energy to plan and execute suicide, right? There's always ambivalence in committing suicide. So a lot of people have suicidal thoughts, but they don't act on it. Now, when you give somebody an antidepressant, it takes two to three weeks. And this is very, very important. A good question. It takes two to three weeks for the antidepressant effects of the medication to become effective. You don't give a medication now, and in a day's time, the individual yes, starts yeah. feeling better. It takes around two to three weeks at least. But the energy level of the individual gets better much more quickly than the, the antidepressant, the depression is being treated. Therefore, during that time, it's going to be important that you monitor the individual because the energy level goes up, the depression is still there, the depressive thoughts are still there, therefore, they are more likely to act on the suicidal thoughts during the early phase before the antidepressant really takes it up. Does that answer the question? So, so it's not you... it's the antidepressant that causing the suicide is that the energy level increases, the depressive, the depression has an antidepressant effect hasn't started yet. So the individual is more liable to commit suicide during that period of time. So that's so... why we keep a close eye and tell the family members that it's possible, especially in adolescence. It's, it's been found that in the adolescence, you have a higher increase of suicidal thoughts than in the older population. Okay. But you always remember you know, that when we give medication, one of the things we always say that this medication is going to take two to three weeks to start acting. And that's why sometimes we give a small amount of the medication. And that's why the SSRI, the serotonin, the newer medication are much better because you can take a lot of it, suicidal attempt, and it's not going to kill you. While the older medication, the tricyclic, that was a major problem. And sometimes we give a small amount of anxiolytic so that you can sleep better and the anxiety level comes down. Because the anxiolytic, in 15 to 20 minutes, they start acting, while the antidepressant is two to three months. So basically, there is no getting around it. You have to take that medication and just keep a close watch on the patient. Right. If you're going to it, get, take an anti, if you're going to treat your anti if the depression, then you need the antidepressant medication. But the newer antidepressants are usually not fatal, right? Even though you might take an overdose of the newer antidepressant, then it's not going to kill you. But if you take of the old medication, that was a major problem. All right, last question, Doc, because time is running and we really have to go, but thank, thank you to everyone who has 
stayed with us thus far. So this is the last question from me. What of depression in children? Adults underestimate this. They believe that children should not de be depressed if they are well cared for or if their physical needs are met. And the person cited um, the case of two children who allegedly committed suicide just recently. So what, what are your thoughts on that, Dr. You notice one of the things, you know, is that children get depressed just like adults. And remember, we spoke about if you have a genetic predisposition and if you've been abused as a child, right? Physically, sexually, neglect, all of those things increases your stress level. And therefore, children are going to have their brain damage and they can become depressed and they can commit suicide and they can have major depression. I think we have our children age, age five, nine, I think, that have committed suicide. It's not, and children walk out into the street for the car to knock them down, et cetera. So children, just like adults, will have major depressive disorder. And it's important if there's a change in behavior if there's a change in behavior for the child, then you, um, you need to do something about it. Take the child to the doctor. If the child is being irritable, not playing like it used to play, changing grades, crying a lot, not being able to sleep in the dark, changing, major change in the child then you need to take the child to the doctor because just like the adults, children are scared. Remember, the brain of a child is developing much more than the child than the brain of an adult. And they are being exposed to all sorts of new, new things. Therefore, their life is also very stressful. Because what you said is that any change and their option, they haven't learned all the options yet, the skills of dealing with stress. Therefore, children are very likely to become depressed. And again, during the adolescent period, there is the uptick of major depressive disorder because again, during that time, you have hormonal changes, you have the brain, the frontal lobe of the brain that manages emotions don't complete its development until age 18 to 21. And that's why it's during that time that an individual move from being a child to being an adult. Because the frontal lobe, the executive part of the brain that manages emotion is one of the last parts of the brain to be fully developed. So children do become depressed and should be treated like the adults. Okay. All right, Doc, last bonus question. <laughs> Listen, this one seems too important not to ask, All right? right? So someone is asking, a teenager echoes that I am going to hang myself. How serious should it be taken if afterwards the child said, oh, I was just joking. What always, do you always, case? underline, always take it seriously. And I say that if a child says that, you need to take that child to see somebody to talk about the issue. Somebody that say they're going to kill themselves, it's a serious threat, right? You don't take it you talk to them about it, ask them, is there a plan, why, etc., and take them to somebody. I recommend that they take them to a counselor as soon as possible so that they can sit and talk about what's going on in the child's life, why they are making that statement, why they are threatening to commit suicide. Very, very, very important especially if it happens more than once. If it happens once, you do it. If it happens more than once, you make sure 
that you take that child to see somebody and sort out the problem because threatening suicide is something that should not, underline not, not be ignored. Don't tell me I have another important one. No, 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 that's it. But I noticed two messages came in, so I was just making sure to tell the participants no more questions because I'm not going to get in trouble tonight. But <laughs> Dr. Wright, thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know you are a, a well sought after man, you know. Um, thank you so much for taking the time just to sit with us and be so patient and understanding and answer all these questions that we had with such clarity. You know, I feel like we all turn experts in, um, <laughs> in in depression and diagnosing depression now. So thank you so much. That your presentation you. has been awesome and the comments have been very good. A lot of people are thanking you and saying it was quite an informative presentation. So that's excellent. Thank you again. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me. I hope I've been helpful. Of course, and we hope to have you back soon. <laughs> Um, we have a thank you to the participants who stuck with us and, you know, it was so interactive. It was so, such a good discussion. Um, I hope we got to all of the questions and if you have any other questions, that's fine. Remember, Choose Life is here for you so you can direct all your questions to us. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming out, but especially we have this well-dressed gentleman on, in, in our panel. And Bishop Boaz, wow, he's coming straight to us from Tanzania, right? Dr. Thomas is going to tell us some more about him, but Bishop, welcome, welcome, welcome. This is one of those times I wish I spoke a different language so I could welcome you in your own language, but I know you understand what I'm saying. So thank you guys for joining us and handing back over to Dr. and Mrs. Thomas. Wow. Oh my goodness. Go ahead, this darling. Has, this has really been just simply awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Wright. Wow. It's like we 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 went to med school or something. <laughs> we learned a lot. Oh my goodness. This was really, really, really awesome. Informative, educational, you know. Really, really good stuff. Thank you so much. Let me just read this one, one comment in the chat. Great presentation, Dr. Wright. You did a great job. Your explanations are so clear. And we just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. My wow. pleasure. Can right, you so on your, your, um, your PowerPoint, please? Yes, so that, I, I yeah. sent it. Yeah, no, just 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 um, unshare. 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 We want to share something else yeah, now. Okay, stop share. Yes. Bye. All right. So, um, a few things here. If you are coming, joining the forum for the first time, and you would, you're not yet on our mailing list, we ask you to add your add something there. Add, just give us your information, name, and and email address would be nice. Um, remember our series comes to an end tomorrow when we'll be talking about suicide and we'll be talking about best practices in suicide prevention. Um, I have, uh, well, Faith and I will be leading in that session and we have Dr. Donald Stewart, who I believe is on the forum now, who will also be uh, with us tomorrow night to answer the questions on best practices in spirituality. Dr. Wright, if you would like to grace us with your presence tomorrow, we, 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 we would like to have you to, not just to help with whatever, if you are able to. Um, any questions. Any questions and so forth. Um, uh, yeah, thank you. So best practices in suicide prevention. And then guess what? We start a new series. It is called Everyday Heroes. And we're going to be just keeping with the, with the theme of Heroes Day coming up soon, and we're going to be having several people who are making significant impact in different parts of the world in their service, including Pastor Boaz. He will be our guest um, on one of these nights. And what time is it in 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 um in Tanzania now? 
Okay, Google, what time is it in Tanzania now? Yes, it is now 2.41 a.m. And Pastor Boaz is here um, to share with us. And we want to say thank you. Thank you. Over 20, um, over 15 years of relationship um, with Pastor Boaz there. All right. Um, so we start next week, Sunday night, our new series. And we'll be interviewing a man who leaned towards Rastafarianism, is now a pastor and has been doing a lot of stuff in the community, mobilizing his church and, and, and so forth to be involved in helping the, in, during this pandemic, but also doing much more on a national level. He, has been, he was honored last year by at the Heroes Day uh, function, and we'll be having Reverend Dr. Peter Garth as our first guest. I, I'm not so, sure what you mean about lean towards Rastafarianism. The man was a Rasta. <laughs> So all the more we have to come out and hear his story and his journey. Yeah. How did he get from there to, to from smoking weed to, to you no know, firing M66, the word of God? Yeah. All right. And then the following day, we will have Pastor Paul Peart out of New York, who will be our guest. And we have seen on some of his Facebook postings the 40 foot containers being parked up at his church. And in this time of pandemic, they are feeding these many people. So we just want to celebrate some, some heroes. I know it's been tough just talking about suicide for almost a month as we they, they did that and it's just a lot. So we're just gonna relax a little bit now and, and just listen to some, sto some inspirational stories that all of us need from time to time, especially in our time of hopelessness and so forth. Want to remind you that Thursday night is our we're celebrating our anniversary, our twelfth anniversary. We're joining with a service from Swallowfee Chapel. We're having participants from the U.S., from from Trinidad, from from Jamaica, and and so forth, and Belize. Yeah. So we ask you to join us. Here is a Zoom um, information, and I think we have also put the Zoom link in the chat here. Um, so come celebrate with us, help give some glory to God as we celebrate our 12th anniversary. And by the way, please note that the password is CLI 12 years. CLI 1, 2 years. Okay, don't mix it up. CLI 12 years. All right, great. And... <clears throat> Um, anything else, Faith? Oh, the TV show takes place. We're going to be continuing some work on suicide prevention as we carry excerpts from our conference, World Suicide Prevention Day conference, and uh, um, on the Thursday forum, Thursday TV show at six thirty. It's called Gear to Live, and uh, repeat on at six thirty on Thursdays. Repeat at six p.m. on Saturdays. So be a part of that. Now, we are also interested in hearing from you as to what are some ways in which we can help to serve you. And so if you have some ideas about our direction, uh, we're going into the Christmas season and into the new year, but we have gone 51 webinars and we feel we are continuing. Hey, I want hey, somebody, I want to, somebody help to solve a problem. Solve a problem. Somebody, somebody sent up somebody some sent money from New York and we're not able to collect it a gift to the Ministry of Choose Life International because it was sent to the, um, it was sent to the agency um, to Choose Life International. So Choose Life needs to go in and sign a document and Choose Life is not able to do it. It needs to take on a human form. So the person, if you are in the forum, just say care of um, Choose Life International, um, attention Donovan Thomas, that would help our faith Thomas. All right, yeah, faith-based organization. We exist to help people live physically, emotionally, and spiritually. You can help us to continue to the work. Yeah, we are renting, we are paying for the Zoom forum. Um, we are paying a monthly fee and, and we have staff involved. So tell us how you can be involved with us. Um, you can donate on our website. You can um, just let us know or you want to, to, try and to, to support and we can give you the banking information our mission in life is to help people live physically, emotionally, and spiritually. I see Rosie Schar Schmidt has raised a hand there. 
Um, I'm gonna take Rose's question. Jordan, can you help me with that quickly, please? Rose, is that deliberate? No, no. No. Okay, all right, great. All right, so um, I just wanna say a big thank you to all of you and I wanna pray over you. I want to pray the blessing of the Lord. So right now, um, if you want to just throw up some, oh, oh, yeah. All right, Jordan has a question there. Go ahead, Jordan. Go, Jordan. October 1, 2020, Choose Life International will celebrate 12 years of serving Jamaica and the nations of the world. We exist to help people live. We want to say thanks to all of you who have supported the work of Choose Life International to all the schools, all business places, all the individuals who have endorsed our work by accepting us to be your partners in serving. Thank you so much. I want to invite you to join us at a special Zoom service on October 1, starting at 6 p.m. Jamaica time as we join in with the Believers Meeting at Swallowfield Chapel. Yes, we'll have testimonies, speakers, and a wonderful time of giving glory to God. Join us 6 p.m. on Thursday, October 1, for celebration of praise to the God who has brought us through 12 years. See you there. Wow, and you notice I'm in my walking gear. We actually, my walking team and I just did something new and ended up at this place with this lovely scenery. And I was inspired. I thought about you while you were there and I extended the invitation. Thank you, um, Kevon, for helping to fix it up um, too. So is there anything else, Faith, before we pray? I want to remind you not to run yet. Um, we want to say hello to those who we want to shout across the sea. So I think Donald is there, want to say hello to, to a pastor ball. So we'll do that in a little while. Anybody else would like to? Anybody would like to put up any prayer requests there? Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity that we have to be with you in this way. Lord, thank you for the time spent. Thank you for the ways in which people are educated. I pray, Lord, that you would bless. I pray that you will meet needs. I pray, Lord, for our presenter. I pray that you will pour into him, that you will bless him, God. And, Lord, I ask that you would bless the participants and that you would help us to be agents of change. Help us, Lord, not to, deal with, not to, not to hug up the stress in these times, but to manage the stress that we don't get sick. Be our guide, Lord, and watch over us as only you can. Pray for every, the, all the needs that are represented here right now. I pray that you come through for us, Lord, that you meet needs. As we start the new series next week, we pray for help from on high. We pray for our session tomorrow as we wrap up this suicide prevention series. Thank you again for our moderator. Thank you for all the committee persons, thank you for all the staff members persons who continue to work behind the scenes to make this happen. And Lord, we give you all the glory. To you be all the praise and the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.